The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. I'm assuming that most of you in here are developers of some sort and that you've been using databases for a while and it's still kind of a dark art what's going on in the internal dark recesses of the database and you're trying to get a little bit better performance out of your queries. Now after I get done, uh, Peter Zaitsev from Bracona who's in the back will be talking about MySQL application architect architecture and uh, what's the full title? Okay, so take what I have and what he has and you'll walk out of here programming God. Ooh, no problem. Uh, a lot of programmers uh, don't have any training in set theory or rela relational calculus or anything similar. And they've really only written one MySQL query in their life. They've just tinkered with it as the applications keep growing. Now, SQL looks funny. It was designed in the 60s and 70s for a specific reason. The idea was to get the most efficient way to pull data off a disk on a computer and into memory or into an application. Now, it's divided up into two parts, DDL and DML, Data Description Language and Data Manipulation Language. And this is where the most of the programmers will start snoring. If you remember Venn diagrams from school, uh, if you do anything, download these slide sets and print out this page. People often don't understand, well, I want the stuff from this table and the matches from the other table, or I want the stuff that doesn't match this table from the other table. Uh, SQL Jones are definitely uh, a black art to a lot of developers. If that's the case for you, please grab a copy of this. So the little query you wrote for your application goes down the wire, turns left into the processor, and the MySQL daemon grabs that. And the first thing it wants to do is make sure that it's valid SQL. Then from there on, it takes a look at that and tries to figure out how am I going to take this and actually do anything out of it. That's called generating a query plan. MySQL, unlike other databases like Oracle, uh, wants to take that statement and optimize it every time it sees it. Where in Oracle, you can lock it down. So once you figure out how to do it right, you have the formula. Uh, MySQL isn't that way. So it's very important that you get a query that's fairly optimized up front. Otherwise, the system will chase its own tail. So after it figures out how it's going to go out to grab the data, it does just that and then returns the data. Now, we have a NoSQL approach that goes straight to the data store, and there's other NoSQL databases out there that don't go through this. And in many cases, that approach is much faster. But the trick is, the power of SQL back here to do things like this pay off. Uh, you can't do ands or ors with a lot of NoSQL databases. Or if you do, it's terribly expensive. So if you can start thinking of sets, of data instead of just one line of data out of a big file and iterating over that dozens of times. This is where SQL pays off. Uh, first goal, uh, a lot of programmers, the first thing they see in SQL code is select asterisk from whatever table. Um, that's shorthand for grab everything. That's really great when you're playing with baby tables. Uh, but what do you do when you have something that's 400 columns wide? Uh, this really gets expensive, especially if you just want two or three columns. So the first thing I want to do is slap your hands and say, no more select stars. The other thing is disk and memory reads, well, disk reads are terribly expensive. They're 100,000 time, 100, times more intensive for time than off out of memory. 
So if you start doing 100,000 backflips here a second, we can come back in 72 days and you'd just be finishing up. That gives you an idea of the scale. Uh, the other thing is, uh, especially with a lot of PHP CMSs, everything is defined that's an integer as a big int, and everything that's a character is a var car 255. Well, you can get away with that, but the trouble is, every big int you have when you only need this big has to come off disk or out of memory, gets transferred over a wire and into your application. And when something's this big times 100,000 versus this big times 100,000, it goes much faster the smaller you make it. MySQL uses a cost-based optimizer. Uh, if you heard my talk yesterday, in the future this is going to change because what we're basing the cost on has had its foundations chain, change. Right now it's the cost of disk I.O. So MySQL is trying to figure out how do I do this query with the least cost. Uh, once again, the query plan, plan is not lockable with MySQL. Other databases, you get the formula, you get the recipe, you're good to go. MySQL sees your, your statement and wants to optimize it every time. Now, to help it out, it builds up statistics about where things are buried out there in the beach tree tables. So it knows how to get there a little bit faster, a little more economical. Uh, good news, yes sir? So does that mean that if uh, you send the same query now and get in five minutes, it might form a different query plan because the statistics have changed? In some cases, yes. Uh, if you do the same query now, and then five minutes later, it might have a slightly different query plan. Yes, is the answer. Um, now, the statistics do help, but the only trouble is if you repower the system, you lose the, the statistical information. It's kind of like you know traffic out front on the main road is busiest between four and six in, in the afternoon, and suddenly you forget that and you're trying to get out at 5.30. So with 5.6, we gave the ability to be able to store off this information when you bring down a server and reload it the next time it comes up. So if you're not running 5.6, uh, please consider switching over. Is that automatic in 5.6? Um, so you have to tell it to do that. I don't think it's the default. I think you have to t turn it's it on. It's a configuration option, but then it's automatic as you're shutting down. Yeah. Okay. Now, this is where things get kind of dark and murky for a lot of uh, non-DBAs or SQL type folks. There's something you prepend to, prepend to queries called explain. So if you have your select star from city, you put in explain select star from city, and it will tell you what the system wants to do to solve your query. Uh, here's an example table. This is from the world database that we've used at MySQL for decades for examples. It's in our documentation in our man pages. It's all over the place. It's uh, easy to download. So it's a simple t city table. Uh, it has an ID number, uh, a name for the city, a uh, country code for you know which country it's in, uh, a district, and a population. Fairly simple, you've probably seen something like this in everything from Drupal, Joomla, uh, whatever else you're using. So let's have a query. Select everything from city, and we gave it a limit. So in this case, it gave us the ID number, the name, the country code, district, and population. Uh, forgive me for being pedantic at the start, but I need to get you all at the same base. So if we run explain on this, it tells us that we had a simple query on the city table and that uh, there was no keys or indexes it could use. And to get those three records, it estimated it was going to have to read 3,839 lines in the table. Uh, if you've never seen a query post pended with a backslash D, it just changes the format out to make it a little bit read more readable. And you'll see a little bit more of that going on. 
Now indexes uh, let you go right to the records or records you want. Uh, imagine having a dictionary that's not an A to Z format and things are repeated here and there and it's not in order and you have to look up the plural for the word moose, which means you have to start at the first page, go to the last page, and keep looking because you might have more than one definition for the plural of moose in there. With indexes, you go right to it. Uh, the other thing is there is some overhead to indexes on reads and writes. It has to actually write out those statistics and that information in the, in the table as it writes out the data. So there is a slight cost to it, but it usually pays off. So this time I usually say, well, we save everything out in a B tree. And I start seeing the programmers going, what's a B tree and why are there Bs around my database and what's going on? Uh, B tree is basically a binary tree, uh, cleave things in half so that you either have records in his case uh, before king or after king, and by splitting things down, you can get down to the records. Now the optimizer, when it comes through and it does its estimates, is figuring if I need to get down here, I have to read all this. So the cost estimate that you'll see um, is from the B tree of information. And of course, we have dozens of select types so if you're not used to explain all this is all gibberish to you, uh, it takes a little bit of reading in the manual and playing with it to, to fully uh, ingest these. Can I ask you a question, Abby? Uh-huh. The slides back on the B tree. Yeah. The index you talked about previously, it's actually indexing the B tree. So you can go, the optimizer can go down the index and not necessarily enter the tree at the top. Yeah. You can enter it at some other point. Yes. Okay, the question was uh, how to repl replace that. The index for the B tree isn't actually digging through the B tree, but actually has entry points buried within there that it knows to jump to. So it knows how to skip certain things. So here's another select, uh, a little more complicated. Uh, select everything from city where the country code equals USA. And when you prepend explain on to it, it comes out and it will tell you <coughs> Uh, once again, it's a simple select. Uh, we're hitting the city table, and we have a reference in here. The reference is we're looking for something that uh, compares to something else. It's a benchmark, a, a marker, a, our index that we're using here. And in this case, we're lucky in that it's a constant. It's not a function, uh, it's not a subroutine, something like that. We know that we only want to look for stuff that says USA. Now, e earlier you saw that it was 3,800 and some odd records. Well now, explain only wants to, it tells us that the optimizer thinks it's only have to read 274 records to get to everything you want. So by using an index, we went from 3,839 down to 274 records. Much, much, much faster. Why do I think that the optimizer didn't consider the limit clause in your previous uh, that's a secret coming up later. Okay, so if we uh, get rid of that index and we uh, try it again, you can see the output oh, is somewhat similar. But now it's coming back and telling us that instead of 3,868 records, it wants to read 4,188 records. Where do those extra records come from? What's going on? Well, this is a case where the statistics are lying to us and explain therefore lies back to us. So if you have a table and you want to use the index, how do you find it? Uh, one simple way is do a describe on the table or a show create table in this example. And it tells us that when the table is created, it had a primary key of ID and also has a key on the country code line there. And for those of you who don't play with foreign keys, we also have another key in here that's a foreign key, which means it points to a foreign table or a different table. What's the power of there is that you can say, any changes I make to this table that's referenced to that table automatically cascade them over. So if I'm updating information, deleting records, 
Uh, you take care of it for me, Mr. Database. I don't want to write the SQL for that. Uh, the other way to find an index is type show index from and then your table name. Uh, in this case, you can see that we have the one for the country code, which is um, right there. And then we have the other one for the primary key for the ID number. NODB will assign a primary key for you if you don't give it one. So do yourself a favor if you're using my uh, NODB, which I highly recommend, um, give all your tables a key that you, you can use on something that you want to use. Are you saying it creates a new column for the primary key? Well, if you don't have one, it, it assumes that it should make one up. Okay. But it's hidden from you and you don't see it. So I'd rather create one that I know about than have it behind the scenes that I can't see. Okay. And one other question. Explain doesn't actually execute the query, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't give you... Explain does not execute the query in most cases. In some cases, it'll actually run it, like if you have a sub-query, it'll actually fire off the sub-query to get some data there. So sometimes on highly busy systems, you don't want to run ex explain during uh, the busy hours. Okay, a little more complex example. Uh, here we're collecting the name from the city table, the name from the country table, and we're aliasing those. So we have name is city from the country table, uh, the name for the country, the population from the city table, and we're gonna pull it from the city table, and we're gonna join that on the country table, and where we tell the, the two tables to scissor up or to match up is the country code column from the city table and the code table from the country table, which is a lot harder to say three times fast than you can ever imagine. So we look at this query, and we know uh, it's going to do it in two parts. Uh, the first one is table B, and table B is our country table. So it's going to, go to want to go through, and for every country it estimates it's going to do roughly 239 reads for every country. Now the second query, it figures it could find all the cities in a maximum of eight reads. It's like the old game named that tune, where they gave people X amount of notes from the melody of a tune to pick out its identification. So, what's our worst case number here? Well, it's 239 times eight, which is almost 2,000 records to read. So, you don't really care about 2,000 records. You're a smart programmer, you realize you know, the Apple iPhone screen that you're having, uh, your user uses in front of you doesn't have that screen big enough for 2,000 columns of data or rows of data. So you only want 20. And by the way, you don't want every little podunk city, you only want the big cities. So we're gonna look at the cities that have, what is that, three million or more population. And you don't wanna send anyone to a real rat hole, so you only want the cities where the average life expectancy is greater than 66 years. And um, you kind of want that sorted. You want to know, uh, you know, have them in alphabetical order for the name and, and then sort by population. But then you only want 20 records. How many of you think this makes a major change to the query plan? Okay. Come back and we put in all these qualifiers and guess what? 239 times eight. This is the, the, the reason why this is such a boring, dry talk, is this is the thing that I have a hard time getting into the brains of programmers. Um, all these little qualifications happen after MySQL does everything to the left-hand side of the where, in this case. So, yes, sir. It is very reasonable to expect that it returns all the information you want and then does the sorting of the information that you... And it goes back and adds the little ands and it, okay. Yeah. 
Um, believe it or not, um, this is like teaching a third grader about reproductive and why mommy has that big bump in front of her. It's a hard concept for a lot of programmers to get. Uh, if I've lost any of you in the weeds, please let me know. Uh, I'm being very pedantic here because this is time and time again, I've just seen programmers stub their toe on it. So how do we make this a little bit easier, a little bit better to read? Well, with MySQL 5.6 and 5.7 and the latest version of Workbench, we um, got smart. We parted, started putting out output from Explain in JSON format. And then we have some pretty parsers that will go through and give you pictures of what's going on. So uh, here's our query again. And this is telling us where it has to order using the sort. And it's doing less than loop join between the two tables, the city and the country, uh, what keys it's using to do that. And that tells you it has the conditions that it runs afterwards. I don't know about you, but I like reading that a lot better than reading that. Why did it filter life expectancy after the join rather than before it? I'm thinking it was more worried about matching up all the cities and the countries and then figuring that would come secondarily. It'd be much cheaper to go through and do that um, well, way. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have an index on there. Now you can force indexes. Yeah. Um, the life expectancy, like he said, was an index. And the other thing is if we wanted to, we went through and we indexed that column and we forced it to use that, the optimizer might choose to follow that path or it might not. It's one of those things where if you're really trying to get the last little iota of information, uh, speed out of your query, that you end up playing with. Uh, so Visual Explain, uh, if you want a better demo, uh, come out to the table. Uh, a couple of you have seen it, and it's, it's rather impressive. Uh, if you mouse over one of the boxes, like the red one there, it will tell you what's going on and how you can improve the query. So, now that I've got you, let's say, going into the high school level of SQL, uh, let's go to a, a little more complex query. Uh, this is using one of our other test bases, test databases called Sequila, also free from MySQL. Uh, it's kind of like you have your own movie rental business. Um, it's nice because it has a lot of complexity built in for illustrating the type of stuff I want to show you folks. So here we're going to grab the customer name, uh, their phone number, uh, the film title from what they rented, and we're going to do joins on all these different tables. And I'm sorry you have to tilt your head over one way. Um, this is where DBAs, uh, you see them, you think they're falling asleep and their head hits the table. No, they're, they're banging their head against the table very slowly over stuff like this. He's laughing because he's a DBA. Uh, I find this much, much, much easier to understand. And what's great is that's wonderful for documentation. And it gives you the nice visual representation that we're doing the join on address, and the join on inventory, and the join on film. So you can see that we're joining on inventory, and the rental ID, and the customer information. Okay, compound indexes. This is something where you can make your life a lot easier. Uh, here we have an uh, index that we created for the address information. Um, character 30 for an address, uh, character 30 for a city, uh, two characters for state, and a zip code. And let's say uh, most of your searches are gonna be on city, state, zip. Now, if you have this index, what's great about it is that you can search on city, state, zip, or city and state, or city. You can't use that index to search on zip, or state, or state and zip. And what's really great about this is it really speeds things up. 
So if you're doing a customer service desk and you have the customer ID number and the company name and maybe their contract number, you don't always get the contract number. Same index covers all the information. One index to maintain, one index to update. Makes life a lot better. Covering index is a similar ID or similar idea. Uh, in this case, uh, on the city table, uh, we're always looking up the population for a country code. We want to know how many people live in that country. But we don't want to uh, overextend ourselves, so we create an index. Uh, here we're using alter table syntax. And we say, okay, we're adding an index called country index on country code and population. So as you use this index and you put in the country code, when it makes a match, it will automatically pull up the population for you, saving a whole bunch of reading into the database. Say that again, please. Okay. If I create a table, I add an index called country index. It, in effect, will bind the population data from... You have an index that has the country code and its related population. So if you want to look it up and just use the index rather than going into the table to look for it, this saves you a whole bunch of reads into the table. You've effectively, effectively created a join. Uh, it's not really a join, but it's a hell of a shortcut. It behaves the same. Yeah, it's a heck of a shortcut into your data. All right. uh, programmers, if you can do this for stuff where you're doing two item lookups, it really saves massive, massive amounts of I.O. It's, it's part of the... Then, then the join analogy is it's not good. Yeah, it, it's not a good join analogy, and, and like you said, this, this only drags the stuff from the same table. Okay. Now, if you want to do something like that, you can use a view. Okay. And the only trouble with views in MySQL, they're not materialized, so as things change, they don't get updated, so you have to kind of force re-reading -re things. Okay, if you're a programmer and you really want to get serious about improving your queries, uh, the best thing you can do is print out chapter 8 from the MySQL manual and put it in your bathroom and uh, do it the old programmer way and read a couple pages at a time. Uh, the other thing is when you're joining tables, do it on like data types. Don't try to get a char with an int. Try to go same size every time you can. Uh, casting isn't that expensive, but if you do something 100,000 times a minute, it gets more and more uh, costly. Also keep your columns as small as practical. We have something called Procedure Analyzed that will look at your information and it will suggest that you don't need seven characters for zip code. But then in the back of your mind, you might, live in a country, you might have some customers that live in a country that have seven characters. So again, you have to know your data to be able to outrule that. But sometimes you'll have something like the VARCAR 255 and you find out the longest entry in there is 50 characters. So save yourself 205 characters. Also, I recommend running an analyze table every so often when things are quiescent. That redoes the statistics and keeps everything reshuffled in the way you want them to go. And the other thing is keep looking for improvements in your code. Uh, it's an iterative process if you're just starting out and improving your, your queries. And there are things, it's like programming, stuff that you wrote two years ago, you look at it now and you kind of grimace and, and if you can read it. Uh, same with SQL. As you get better, you'll find out that it takes a little bit of experience to do some really good stuff. Now, it's hard to teach people how to write great SQL in a couple, you know, in a 40 minute session or so. Um, the two books I really, really recommend our uh, high performance MySQL, uh, which is now uh, third edition. Uh, first edition is about that big, second is that big, third edition is uh, rather massive. Um, it's worth reading through. Uh, it, it has a lot of detail. Now, if you want a simpler path to go on, 
uh, effective MySQL optimization. A uh, much smaller book, it's about 120 pages, it's just on query optimization, where the other one uh, deals a lot with server tuning and a lot of other stuff. Uh, they're both good books, and I highly recommend both. If you get a chance, uh, we have our own show. It's part of Oracle Open World. Uh, we have five days in San Francisco, and you're going to be able to talk to the folks, uh, our, the engineers who write this code, uh, some of the customers. Uh, Percona is going to be there, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and you can see what people are doing. Uh, if you get a chance to go, uh, hit the Playful Play session. They run the biggest online game in Central and South America. Uh, the stuff they do is absolutely amazing. They do it with a very small staff on a very limited budget. Early bird registration ends on July 18th and saves 500 bucks. Uh, this is your chance to talk to the top MySQL folks, and we're going to have a lot of tutorials, including a lot of query tuning, well, one big query tuning tutorial that I'm aware of now. Now, I want to thank you all for going through this. This is dry as hell. Um, I, I know it's boring as, as heck, but it pays off, and it's hard to get programmers to try to change their ways. So I really appreciate you all coming out and listening to me. So what questions do we have? Oh, yes, sir. Can I create an index on an expression? An index on an expression. Like lower, lower uh, column? Um, probably it's going to be restricted to just the column. I know in MySQL you're going to only have indexes on columns. I don't know about other databases. It's kind of hard to index something that's non-deterministic, where you don't already know where you're going to leap when you. When you just a, it's a function of the column value. Function of the column value. I don't think, Peter, you can't do that, can you? Well, no, you can't do it in MySQL. There are some, uh, some other databases. Uh, Postgres. Postgres, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Um, so going back a little bit to that, uh, that note about how all the qualifications don't factor into the yeah. Code, does that mean there's no like significant overhead time afterwards, or is it just like the, the explain just doesn't know about? It? Okay, you put all the qualifications on the query, and you have the population, the age, and all that stuff. Is there overhead to all that stuff afterwards? Yes. Uh, can I paraphrase it and say, if you don't put all the qualifications on, can I get the data back faster from the server? Yes. Uh, the trouble is, if you want all those qualifications, it's a lot easier to have the power of the database do that for you than it is to feed it into your application and iterate over that data to cut out the stuff you don't want. That's where the database power works for you. Um, unfortunately, if you want speed, you kind of have to do that. And, and the, the time can actually be pretty horrendous because sometimes you have one or two temp tables that have to be created. That means you might have to go off to the operating system and say, hey, get me a temp table. And, and uh, it, it can get pretty massive. Yes, sir. If I'm joining to a subquery, is there some way to, uh, in effect, index that subquery so that I can be uh, joining on an index? Index, uh, well, the old joke used to be that Postgres didn't do joins and we didn't do subqueries. Uh, that's changed a lot in the last couple of releases for both uh, Postgres and MySQL. Uh, with 5.7, you actually do get an index out of the subquery. Mm -hmm. um, it may not still be as fast as a join if you can do a straight join rather than a subquery. You have to, to play with that. But you do get the benefits of indexes out of subqueries now. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping the where clause stuff, let's go back. obviously if it's a simpler query, the where clause elements will of course reduce the number of the... Uh, yeah. Well, and if the age was indexed, it couldn't really change the query. 
Yeah, it, it, yeah. This is this is where DBAs really earn their money at the big shops is because they're saying, well, maybe I don't want to index all the population. Maybe I just want to index the, the leading four uh, numbers. So I make sure that I get the folks who are in the millions instead of all that. Uh, there's all sorts of games you can play with indexes to get that. Uh, what's real funny in the Western world, rather than search on someone's entire last name, you can usually get 85% accuracy with the first four or five letters of their name. Uh, does not work in China. Does not work in Japan. And I've been told it doesn't work in some parts of Africa, but um, there are little games like that you can play with your data to speed things up. Does MySQL attempt to convert subqueries and front calls into just a, a plain join in order to better optimize things? Well, until 5, 6, 5, 7, we told people, take your subqueries uh, that you, you have and turn them into joins because we didn't do oh, subqueries okay. very well. Okay, uh, 5, 6, and especially 5, 7, really do subquery optimization now. Uh, in the past, it's kind of like, oh, we've got down to the one foot yacht line on the football field, we're just going to punt because we don't know how to yeah. do that. We'll just brute force the rest. So, so it does it now. It, it does five, it now. Six. Five, six, and five, seven, yeah. Yes, sir? Uh, where can I find these so called test databases? The test databases. Yeah, the, I'm trying to find them from the website. Uh, if you go to documentation, on dev.mysql.com and search down at the bottom. Or the easiest thing is type in MySQL World Database in ODB. Yes, sir. I've got an older server that still runs 5.1 and uh, try to create a view with a uh, subquery in the front clause. Uh -huh. Uh, because we're creating a view with a subquery, uh, I don't know how well that performed. And the trouble is, 5.1 doesn't really do subqueries all that well, and we don't handle materialized views even in 5.7. So I'd, I'd have to see the code and play with it to be able to tell you how well it goes. Um, is there any way we can get you up to 5.5, 5.6? Five, 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 <laughs> Um, a couple months ago, I ran to someone who stuck on 4.1 because the contract wrote in explicitly, this will be written on top of MySQL 4.1. And, uh, well, it's a very good paying job and the guy's close to retirement and really doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, anything else, or? Once again, I, I thank you because I know this is the driest talk in the entire weekend series and it's hard to convey to, to programmers the value of this because this saves you so much time and effort later on and it's a real pain in the butt to get started but it does pay off. Yes sir. One, uh, one thing I was going to point out earlier um, when you were showing you know like for example the simple query you know and it showed the execution time and then you got to the more complicated query that was similar unfortunately the execution time was 0.0. .0. I was going to point out that people should look of course at the execution time in addition to of course the number of rows and things like that. But because it's in the query cache, well, not there. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, well, it, it's it explained. It's not really running the query there, right? Yeah. In, sure. in this case. Sure. Sorry. But yeah. at the same time, too, if oh, you're if you are running a query though, and you're trying to look at the execution time, you know, like the second time through, you could always reset the query cache if it's not a busy server, because otherwise, you know, that results that might be in the. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole bunch of work on statistical testing of queries. Um, we have a, a lovely gentleman named Dmitry Kovachuk who works for us, and he routinely runs these iter things many iterations just to make sure that the query times, the response times that he's seeing, you know, there, there's, you know, someone hasn't popped an LDAP query or uh, mail hasn't gone through a system to make sure they balance out. And to get that consistent is, a, is a also a work of art to get that really well. Do you have a set, you've got these test databases, do you uh, also have a set of test queries that go with these databases? Uh, we don't formally have a set of test queries that go with our test databases, but if you look at our documentation, you'll see a whole bunch of, you know, do this, do this, don't do this uh, type of examples. But as a formal set of queries, no. Yes, Peter. So, just for this query, do you uh, run any uh, regression tests on the query performance and uh, maybe any embedded benchmarks? So, can we make sure what the MySQL 5.7 will run all queries on, on par or faster than MariaDB 10? 
Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the planted question. Um, uh, last two weeks, I've been able to sit next to a gentleman named uh, Jeb Miller, who's one of our engineers, and he's our quality engineer guru. He runs thousands of tests each night on a whole slew of queries he's picked up over the years. And anytime there's a patch made to, the, to MySQL, he runs regression tests against that. And we have roughly 40 other people who work with him that once he finds something's running slower or not as fast as it should, uh, they immediately dig into it to try to do it. And every night, I forget how many thousands of queries they run, and he has a beautiful display that he developed. I wish I could show it all. So there's something even off by a tenth of a percent. He knows about it as soon as the test finishes. Yeah, but those queries are not available for public viewing. Um, a lot of them you probably wouldn't want to see because a lot of those queries are probably like TPC benchmarks, um, ordering customer data that's way out of date. Um, it, it's one of those things where we know where the, the queries that hurt us are and the sweet spot queries are, and we keep testing over and over again to make sure we don't regress anywhere. So. But that's correct, that they're not available, right? They're not available, and they'd be probably boring as hell and not useful to anyone else but him. So, do you, do you just need thousands of queries that you want to use for tests or something like that? It would be amazing. Uh, I think it's a, you know, it's a painful thing, right? Because more, more, uh, most valuable cases in the customer, query the customer data, which you can't really get an open Yeah. Um, when I worked for a, another database company, um, we were looking through all sorts of different data sets and just making up stuff all the time. And I've never really found a good suite of just open queries of stuff to, to try out for examining. And if you do find one, please let me know. Any other questions or? Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, you're welcome, you're welcome then, yes, thank you. Yeah. Well, the first step is to admit that you have a problem and you're coming to MySQL, it's the first step. Okay. No, we're running Sybase 10 and it's just, it's just finally time to think about it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, the first thing I suggest is get a copy of MySQL Workbench, which is free, and it has a conversion tool that I know works with SQL Server, and I think it runs with Sybase, but I'm not 100% sure. Let me ask this question. We've been very careful over the years to make sure that all the SQL we wrote is simply ANSI standard with little or no custom extensions provided by a, a, a vendor. Mm -hmm. so Yeah, it, if you keep to the ANSI standard, it, it should mostly run. It's the stuff that doesn't fit in the mostly that's going to make you earn your paycheck. No, no, if my mostly is 2 or 3%, that's good. Yes. If I can make one comment to reiterate what Dave said at the beginning, please run NODB for all your tables should always be NODB unless you really know that you need a different engine. The NODB gives you a lot of different advantages. Yes. Yeah. You should even set it in the configuration file that the default engine type is NODB. So that if somebody accidentally creates a table and doesn't specify the engine, because otherwise it's going to default to depending on which version you're running. Yeah, well, 5.6 and later, which hopefully he's going to 5.6 or 5.7. Um, the other gentlemen are a table. Uh, if you talk to him, are you local to this area or Raleigh? Or? I'm in Greenville, South Carolina. Greenville. Um, well, he's in Raleigh and he can easily make the drive and uh, he does a lot of conversions. Uh, the conversion itself, I've been doing a lot of Microsoft stuff lately. Uh, it goes very well except for the stuff that fits in that 1-2%. And unfortunately, sometimes that 1-2% is an onerous mountain for stuff to climb. We, we've tried to be pretty meticulous about that. We don't have any views in the, in the system at all. Mm -hmm.
but uh, and we have exactly one stored procedure. Okay. You, you should be good there. No triggers, no actually we have no I turned that trigger off. We have no triggers at all. Okay. So I correct I don't, I don't know about my scale, but I think, <coughs> and I don't know about Sybase, but SQL Server has the weird quoting thing where you put the, the names in square brackets. Right. Yeah. Does MySQL support that? Um, no. Do you use that? No. Yeah. Sybase does, does not use the strange Yeah. Uh, Column names, table names, whatever you want. Yeah. yeah, Microsoft decided to format some of their stuff different from the original Sybase product just to show that they were different. Um, <laughs> and that's, and that's, so that's a purely a SQL Server thing, square brackets? Yeah, I'm sure it's SQL Server and one other database that's written in Loris Lobovia that you need the lower Sibovian dialect uh, character set to, to actually take advantage of that. But it's, it's a, a Microsoftism. Uh, the, the funny thing for me is I'm hitting a lot of Microsoft shows now, and Microsoft just went to an open source, frame, open source programming framework based on Laravel, which is a PHP framework. And you go to these shows and you say, well, if you're running an open source framework on PHP, why are you not running an open source database? Microsoft. Yeah, their uh, their new framework. Unfortunately, its name escapes me right now. I want to call it Entity or something like that. It's basically Laravel. Well, you, that's part of the ANSI standard. You can't put single quotes or double quotes around when double you create a table. It's what you, does MySQL support that now? Um, you used to have to do the grab accents. Yeah, you, you, you don't. On your you don't have to, but some of the Microsoft stuff has brackets in there that kind of freaks everybody well, out. Yeah. Brackets will freak you out, but what about the double quotes? Which double you quotes mean? should parse right through. Okay. Now, the, what usually hurts is you have programmers like me that do one back single quote and then a regular single quote and they can't figure out for two hours what he did wrong. And, okay. But that's just that me. Yeah. Or if you copy and paste from like a word processor, a lot oh. of times those will catch you with the, the quote and the single smart quote. Yeah. Or the smart quotes, yeah. 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 Those will drive you nuts. Because you want to what's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was just a, a question about single quotes versus double quotes versus brackets and queries, so nothing too amazing. Well, bless you all for sitting through this. I know it's drier than heck, and thank you for coming. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.